So, welcome once again to the Reality Report with a uh, perhaps familiar guest, Angela Voss, who was on ooh, a couple of years ago, can't remember when, talking about the Mundus Imaginalis, um, Sufi mysticism, and Neoplatonic philosophy. But this time we're going to talk about astrology because Angela is one of the few people I've met who's highly intelligent and scholarly and deeply involved in academia and scholarship and yet is a practicing astrologer. So rather than talk, starting from a personal point of view and asking about how you got involved with astrology because I think that would then go into we would end up talking a lot more around the whole belief uh, involved. Maybe we could um, just talk about the history of astrology as just a quick sketch of uh, what, where, where it came from and how it's evolved. Um, so okay. what as far as I'm aware it's about 4,000 years old and emerged out of Babylonia. What's your what's Yes, your well, we, we don't know exactly when it emerged, mm. but there was obviously a very ancient tradition in Babylonia and Mesopotamia and surrounding areas right. of stargazing and omen reading. Right. So the first astrology was about reading the signs in the, in the heavens, mm. and they noticed that when certain stars came into prominence, certain events might happen in the world, so they made correlations between planets and movements and worldly events. This is all recorded in clay tablets, presumably? This is, yes, this is, so the, the um, Babylonian, that's a book by Michael Bajant on the um, Babylonian clay tablets and astrology. Okay. But um, the first horoscope, I believe, is around 400 BC okay. and is Greek. So we don't actually have the horoscope as we know it as right. until fairly okay. later, later on. Um, and then so that's like three thousand, almost um, no, a couple of thousand years of, of people doing something like astrology, yes. but without the idea yes. of. A, and by horoscope, you mean a, a birth mean, chart? I mean, I mean a birth chart noting the moment that somebody yeah. was born. So that was that was an innovation born. after. after that was that. an innovation, mm. and it seems to have arisen the same sort of time as early Greek science and computing, obviously, because okay. you had to have quite a, a, a detailed knowledge of astronomy in order to okay. do Okay, so it wouldn't just wouldn't have been possible to do it to that kind of precision, perhaps? No, mm. probably not. But the early astrology was very divinatory in that it was about reading signs, understanding the meaning of the signs because of the related events in the world, mm. and therefore being able to start, well, and because the stars were regarded as divinities, because the whole cosmos was regarded as, as a divine being. Mm. Therefore, it was about negotiating and finding your way with the intelligence of the heavens through reading the signs, reading the stars as signs, in a very divinatory kind of way. Mm. Um, and it was then only with a, a more sort of scientific attitude that came in with, with, with the Greeks, and particularly Aristotle, that you started getting the idea of computing horoscopes, and then the idea of being able to tell fortunes or tell fates, because once you could start measuring planetary movements and planetary um, cycles, if you had an idea of the meaning of, of the planets, you could then start foretelling what would happen in a certain period of time. Mm. Um, the problem with that is that it be, then became sort of, um, sort of geared or sort of taken into a, a much more kind of cause and effect um, sort of rational model, rational model of causation, because instead of reading the stars as symbols, it started to be seen as a kind of mechanistic process. The stars were influencing the stars our were lives. Influencing, and then I see. It, and then you could predict something that would happen in a year or two yeah. years because of the cycles, oh. because of the meanings. And so the divinatory aspect sort of started going underground or started diminishing, and okay. the scientific rational aspect oh. began... Um, so, yeah, a horoscope isn't really divin divinatory in that sense, is it? I mean, it gets these things all get lumped together, oracles, the I Ching, tarot, astrology, but it's... The divinatory part of it is that pre-horoscope part. Well, this is where astrologers will differ. Okay. I mean, I tend to definitely agree with um, astrologers such as Geoffrey Cornelius, who's done a lot of work in this area, that actually all astrology is essentially divinatory because you're interpreting a symbol um, in the moment, in that very moment of interpretation. You're moving into a completely different mode of understanding the mm. power of symbolic interpretation even though the horos there's a sort of certain rule whereby you calculate a horoscope at the moment of birth, that doesn't actually detract from the fact that the actual act of interpretation is a divinatory act. But a lot of astrologers will disagree with that and say, oh no, it's, it's, it's much more of a sort of causal, mechanistic, Right, and they see themselves more as technicians process. who are just sort of doing calculations and then it just sort of 
following a almost an algorithm to determine what they mean. But it's a different, yeah, it's a more it's, mechanistic it's, approach, both in terms of the effect of the stars or the planets and mm. the way that the, the astrologer would then deal with the. It can be, right. and I think it's very much to do with the attitude of the astrologers. Yeah. So, you know, a very um, symbolically minded astrologer will always be reading this in, in terms of a kind of um, you know, signs that can be negotiated. It is part of a kind of ongoing process of, of working with a whole dimension of reality that's beyond the rational. But then there's always been also been a very kind of rationalistic, literalistic kind of astrologer who will interpret charts in a very fatalistic way mm. and, and read them in a very me mechanistic kind of way. And therefore, and this is one of the, one of the great um, objections of, of the Renaissance humanist astrologers, and therefore subject people to a fixed fate. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and the fixed fate is not in the stars, the fixed fate is in the pronouncement of the astrologers. That's, that's the problem, mm. and that's the kind of dilemma that we've been left with today as well. I see. So there are these two currents. This is really interesting. Um, but I just want to get this clear. If we go back to the Babylonians, before the Greeks started working with horoscopes, you talked about, you know, the, watching the watching the stars, watching the planets, and um, seeing correlations with events in the world. What kinds of events, based on what records we have, I and mean, what kinds of things we're talking about? Not so much the details of individual people's lives. Yeah. Not, not so much what's going to happen um, to me, but things which would affect the whole community more. This or, isn't my area of expertise, okay, but right. I I would say that it's most likely that it was to do with um, noticing when there was success in battle or okay. whether there was a famine or a plague or okay. kind of more like social cultural yeah. kind of events yeah. that were seen to correlate. So it, because at the same time it became more more calculation based, the more sort of rationalistic and scientific, it became more about the self as well. Okay. Well as far as we know, yes, mm. I mean uh, as far as we know the personal horoscopes or the yeah. individual looking at their own life and their own fate started coming in um, much later. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, and, and now, today, you have, like you say, the sort of literalists. It's a, it's a little bit like reading reading the Bible in the sense that you have people who just take it as it says this and it, that's what it means and take mm. it all literally, mm. um, which leads to some sort of absurd consequences. But mm. some people, you know, stick with it, fundamentalist Christians who just take the Old Testament literally. And then you have other people like, say, former Archbishop Rowan Williams who could read the same passage and then deliver a really beautiful symbolic interpretation of it yeah and it's, it's the same thing it's in the exactly, world of astrology it is exactly yeah. the same okay. thing yeah. so um obviously the period that i know most about is the renaissance period mm. and um with Mussolini Ficino, who completely reformulated astrology and, and re-envisioned it right. um, and he was a composer as well he was a composer yeah. musician philosopher translated the complete works of plato but one of his greatest achievements um, and one that wasn't really recognized by scholars until quite recently was that he that astrology was totally part of his platonic worldview mm. so uh, and it's because he understood the power of reading the cosmos as a poetic metaphor not as a literal mechanistic cause when he wrote vitriolic treatises against the astrologers of his time um, because he called them petty ogres because mm. they were determining people's fates by making pronouncements in this very literal kind of way mm. And um, he completely reread astrology as part of a um, Platonic worldview. Right, so he was going back to an earlier sort of. Um, he was going back to a, a sort of near Platonic yeah. um, understanding of the power of the imagination to enter into, um, well, the power of the imagination to kind of move to a whole different way of understanding what knowledge is, mm. which is a kind of. As what Jung would say, it's like active imagination. It's it's entering into a completely different mode of, of thinking. Yeah, and so yeah. then you get this clash. We come into the scientific age, yeah. and so scientifically minded skeptics and people that you might read about if you just casually look up astrology on Wikipedia will tell you all about these experiments. These very well organised and coordinated double blind experiments with professional astrologers, where the astrologers themselves have been involved in in the experiment design and. You know, and it's all very well controlled, and it shows that astrology has absolutely no predictive power, and therefore it's a pseudoscience, and we should just move on, ignore it. It was just a that yes. kind of approach. It's like I don't imagine you take issue with the results of those experiments. It's just it's almost like they're missing the point. Somehow. They're missing the point, and they're are they subjecting an art which 
cannot prove itself mm. in those terms to terms which are completely unsuitable for that art. Yeah. It's like saying, you know, let's subject the, the emotion of falling in love to, you know, a sort of scientific analysis, and then by the time you've done that, you've stripped away mm. the, the power of that kind of, you know, that power but, but, of knowing. But to deny that it's a thing that's real in people's lives would be absurd. It would be because absurd. Because anyone can... can yes. You know. I mean, you, you wouldn't subject a poem, you know, you wouldn't subject mm. the kind of... The, right. the meaningful narrative of a, of a poem, you yeah. can subject that to I think a statistical analysis and laboratory, would you? Perhaps the difference is that unlike falling in love or a poem, astrology presents itself, at least, you know, quite um, commonly these days, as something that looks vaguely sort of scientific or mathematical well, because exactly. it involves somebody going through tables yes. or running some software. Yes. So therefore people think, ah, someone's doing yes. something, it looks a bit like science, yes. so therefore let's scrutinise it as if that's what it is. And when you do yes. that, it, it appears to be worthless. Yes, of course. Um, but then I think it's like everything to do with the occult or magical operations, any kind of divination. Because we've lost a language in which that, that kind of practice can be understood within a greater whole. It can be understood within a kind of holistic cosmos where there is no sort of cut-off between... Um, sort of faith, imagination, spiritual understanding and reason, you know, they're mm. all part of a whole, um, they found their place. But now, you know, in our post-enlightenment world, there's been a sort of cut between these two realms. Yeah. And following Kant, you know, following the, the Enlightenment philosophers, anything that's not positive, what Kant would call positive knowledge, has been thrown into this sort of collective shadow and become superstitious knowledge. Uh, positive so knowledge being the sort of positive thing the logical positive. Yeah, the lo would yes, that, that can be, be observed and annotated and understood in, in a rational logical way. Yeah. Anything so, that's not that has just be, all been lumped into the well, same. Well, in a way it, it has. And mm. that, I mean, that's not Kant's fault himself. I mean, as far as I can remember, Kant says that um, it's not that these things are not real, it's just that. So that philo analytical philosophy, as he was introducing it, is, is out of the, its domain. It doesn't it, apply. It can't apply, yeah, it, that yeah. you cannot go there. And then later philosophers took that even further. Mm -hmm. It's not that you couldn't go there, it's it actually became illicit, it became superstitious, it became woo-woo, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and now here we are in 2018, and there are some people who would say that, that you know, there are, there are enemies out there, there are enemies of reason yes. who are threatening the very fabric of civilization, people yes. who are promoting this woo-woo, superstitious nonsense. And so Richard Dawkins and his friends are leading this sort of crusade against this dangerous tendency. Yes. So not only is it seen as, I mean, there are some people that would just dismiss it as unscientific and move on, just think it's just something superstitious. But you also have people suggesting this is, this is a dangerous tendency. So, um, you know, some astrologers presumably feeling embattled by that. Well, this, I, th I think um, Ian McGilchrist has a lot to say about this in yeah. his book, The Master of yeah, Demonstration. Yes, again, this book comes up. Fantastic know, book. It's the most quoted book on the Yes, well, I'm not surprised yeah. because I don't think anyone's done the work he's done it's in, in, in going through. It's the most beautiful synthesis. Yes, it's the most beautiful synthesis of what's happened to human thinking over the past 2,000 years. Yeah. And that he understands both the poetic he and the analytical. Uh, he, he does, yeah. and, he, and he again, you know, in a way, carrying on the Platonic tradition, understands that they are both necessarily part of a whole. So what, what's happened is that instead of um, what is due to what science can do, what it can do marvellously and amazingly well, sticking to what it can do mar amazingly and marvellously well, it's trying to encroach on a territory which is not, doesn't belong to it. No. So what McGilchrist would call the world of the right hemisphere is the world of entering into a poetic understanding. It's the world of metaphysics, it's the world of of, of, of uh, mystical experience, mm -hmm. it's the world of um, any kind of magical experience. As he says something very interesting, he says um, magic to the left hemisphere is, uh, is dangerous because it's about powers it doesn't understand, whereas magic to the right hemisphere is simply the language it speaks. Yes, right. That's